أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين لا قيام يوم الدين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين عليهم السلام We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to gather, to congregate uh, on this day, which is a very special day, a very blessed day, and an important day for the, the well-being, the spiritual energy of the Muslim community, the Muslim ummah as a whole, and its commemorations of days like this, or perhaps understanding the value that days like these hold, that act as very important, pivotal uh, cases that determine the outcome of an Islamic community and the vision and the, the backing that an Islamic community and a Muslim community has for self-development and connection with Islamic teachings. So of course today we're kind of wrapping up, we're on the, the eve of the day of Arafah, the day of Arafah being the ninth of the Hajjah. Very important day, of course tomorrow is the Eid, which everyone will celebrate and it's a day that should be celebrated. But what happened today is nothing short of what will happen tomorrow. In the Holy Quran and in Hadith, we are instructed and we are educated that there are certain times that are made special for us as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to engage in certain acts of worship. For example, we have from Hadith narrated from the Holy Prophet that inna li rabbikum fi ayyami dahrikum nafahat. Know that indeed, surely in your time, in your lifetime, there shall be nafahat translated as, uh, as winds or breezes of mercy. So indeed, make sure that you make yourself available for those as well. We have in the Holy Quran passages where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about days of Allah. For example, in Surah Baqarah 203, And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the appointed days. Or in Surah Ibrahim, verse 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ And remind them of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the first verse in Surah Baqarah, they say it speaks to actually the period that we're in right now. Generally, most commentators will say the 11th, the 12th, the 13th of the Hajjah. But there are specific times now that we are instructed to be a little bit more aware, conscious of what's happening around us. Because it's possible if we don't actually open our eyes, that we don't see the difference of a day like this versus other days of the year. But the hadith, the sunnah, the Quran is telling us that this day is different. So what is different about it? Because if we look at it superficially, everything looks the same. All time looks the same. Every day looks the same. But what is happening in the background, what is happening in reality, someone who is at a higher stage, higher level of understanding is telling us that this day is not equal to other days as well. So make sure that on this day, you are conscious and cognizant of what is happening. One of the a'mal that is recommended to, to be done on this day is to read the dua of Imam Zainul Abidin on the day of Arafah. He has a dua in his uh, Sahifat al Sajjadiyah. It's um, traditionally dua number 47 in the, in the list of, in the order of the Sahifa that most of them have. He expresses and he describes this day like this Oh Allah, this is indeed the day of Arafah, a day which we have made noble. You've given honor and you've magnified within it. You have spread your mercy. You've shown kindness to your pardon. Made plentiful your giving. And by it you have been gracious towards your servant. So this day, Yawm al-Arafah, is equivalent or very equal in value to another very important day. And if we want to summarize two days in the Islamic calendar that are important for self-development, it's the day of, or the night of Qadr, which is unknown in the sense that it could be one of three days or one of a number of days in the last 10 days of Shah Ramadan. And the next day is the Yawm al-Arafah. That in hadith from Sadiq he states, Man lam yughfar lahu fi Ramadan, a person who has not been forgiven during the month of Ramadan. That means during Laylatul Qadr, if a person has not engaged sufficiently to receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lam yughfar lahu ila qabil. 
he shall not be forgiven until the next year comes, until that next instance. With one exception, illa an yashhad arafa. Unless the person witnesses arafa, yashhad. Not his living during arafa means he, he, he becomes a witness to what is happening on the day of arafa. So, for the person who's performing the pilgrimage, there's no other activity to do but to engage in the arafa. And there are different stages of actually witnessing what is happening. Because there's a witness that you see with your perceptive faculties and there's a witnessing that now you're seeing with higher faculties that you have, with your mind, with your spirit. The eyes of the heart now opens and you can see what's happening. But in an environment that you're not surrounded by everyone doing the same thing, and perhaps in this community, I don't know how much of a, of a commonplace it is for the Yawm Al-Arafah, for people to engage in the recitation of, for example, Dua Al-Arafah that Imam Hussain has recited, or even fast on this day. It's a very normal, traditional thing to do. But we may find ourselves, even though we are surrounded by other Muslim men and women, brothers and sisters, but activities like these that are seen as so normal, traditional, common, they're few and far. People who actually know that today is a day that should be fasted. A day that a person should engage in activities like this. So we have something like half an hour left. It's my brotherly advice. If you have not engaged, don't listen to what I'm saying. Find these du'as right now and just kind of go through the translation a little bit. And I'll share a few small lines of them in case we haven't been able to engage as well as we should have. This is a day of mercy. It's a day of remembrance. It's a day of repentance. This opportunity should not pass. Once this opportunity passes, very few opportunities will be available like this. So it's not about God closes the doors of His mercy. No, His door is always open so long as the person knocks. But the point is, certain days he set up his, his, I guess you can say, opportunity to make it easier for us to receive more. And hence, Yawm Al-Arafah is one of those days. The final point that I'll make, inshallah, and we'll kind of transition to sharing a few of these phrases that we recited today, hopefully, and if we've not, we can at least engage with them at this level, is for a person to have the etiquette of being hopeful in prayer. When we're praying, we're not praying to read something. That means... Even the Qur'an that we're sent is not like we read it because it's a, it's a scripture that God sent that He wants to be read for the sake of reading. No, nothing should be read for the sake of reading. Anything should be done for the sake of engaging with the essence of what is being done. The activity, every activity has an essence. The essence is what's important. The medium by which it happens is not important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the medium for us to engage in higher levels of of, of learning, of ma'rifah, of knowledge, of gnosis through the medium of the Holy Qur'an and through dua that has been instructed to us by the Imams and the Holy Prophet. These aren't things that people just sat down and thought of. No, this is divine instruction. This is what you should say. This is the channel that will allow you to ascend yourself. Allow you to, to, to free yourself from all of the chains, the shackles that is holding everyone else and everything else behind. You should free yourself like this. So al-fajir al-raji, a person who is a sinner, but is hopeful in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ta'ala aghrab minha min al-abid al muqannat A person who is a sinner, but is hopeful of Allah's mercy, is nearer, is closer, is more proximate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a person who worships, but doesn't have this sort of idea, that feels like they're hopeless. Whatever I do, Allah will not accept. So, the point here is this, even if we engage in shorter amounts of acts of traditional worship, as we call them, even that should be with the quality of knowing that there's always hope and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer, more proximate, is more favorable to the person who turns to him with hope. Imagine now if we're engaging in acts of worship, but the act of worship is, 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 is empty. We're doing it, but we don't expect and anticipate anything to come of it. What kind of an action is that? If I pray knowing that I'm committing other sins, I'm praying because it's an obligation. I know this prayer is not going to result in any sort of personal change. What kind of a prayer is that? Really, we have to ask ourselves, why even pray? Now the shaitan comes and says, why should you pray to begin with? So he says, don't pray, because that's better for you to pray a prayer that is without utility. So then we stop praying even. It's dangerous, it's a trap that none of us should fall into. We should always look at the value of what we're doing. So I'll share just a few of these uh, phrases from Dua al-Arafah from Imam Sina alayhi salatu wasalam and inshallah we'll move on for a few points that we'll take from the life of Muslim Ibn Aqeel the day that we're tonight commemorating his martyrdom we can say the first of Imam Sina alayhi salatu wasalam's martyrs the first martyr of Karbala in some senses so 
One point about why on this day it's important to fast. Fasting is a good thing to do. It's, you know, it has rewards. Uh, there are few days that you can find that we don't have hadith that speak about fasting to be recommended. Okay, so it's almost like as if the rule is to fast, the exception is not to fast in hadith. But in any case, there's a reason why on days like this, the fasting is coupled with it. You'll find on days that you're engaged in intense acts of worship, like the day of Arafah, like Laylatul Qadr, that's, that's, that's a night time, but other days as well, the fasting is recommended. Why? There's nothing wrong with eating. But like in Shah Ramadan, there's, a, there's something that comes from fasting that allows a person to better engage in the activity that is right now important. What is that? So imagine now, if I want to read a, a dua, that let's say it's, if I read it at a normal pace, it's an hour long. Okay. If I'm full, if I've eaten and I'm full, and I've eaten too much, unfortunately, excessively, now an hour dua becomes impossible. I can't read it because I'm tired. And if I do read it by chance, because my body is really working so hard to digest the food that I put in, my, in myself, it can't allow enough for the brain to say, imagine, there's not enough blood getting to the brain. All of the attention of the body is going towards digesting the food that's been put in. Not enough will allow for reflection. So Allah says, I want you to read these du'as. Why? To reflect on your own state. To look actually clearly at what's happening. Look at a mirror that's clean, that's reflective. And based on that, you'll have epiphanies. And on that epiphany, you'll make decisions to change yourself. If the stomach is full now, you're dedicating a portion of your energy to try and, 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 and fight with what is normal, but you can survive by not eating for a short period of time so your mind will become clear. So the more the stomach is empty, the mind becomes clear, the mind opens up. So this is a principle that we have in Islamic teaching. There is definitely a relationship. The more the stomach is full, the less the mind is able to work efficiently. So if you look at someone like me, you can obviously see I have a problem, right? That means my mind is not working well. Not to say that anyone that, for example, is, 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 is you know, skinnier, their mind, no. But the point is that among the Islamic etiquettes is to make sure that there's some sort of balance. Okay, so here are a few um, verses that I selected that I think kind of summarize the essence of what the dua is saying. Very early on, that means within the, the first, I think, 20 statements and phrases that we make, the crux of what we're trying to say is there. This message should not be lost. We can read for hours and hours and hours. If we don't get the point of what's being said, it's, it's pointless. We state, Allahumma inni arghabu ilayk. O oh Allah, I willingly desire you. Arghabu. Avraghba. I long for you. I desire for you. Washhadu bir rububiyyati lak. Wa ashhadu. And I bear witness to your mastership over me. That you are my Rabb, you are my master, you have ownership over me. Muqirran bi'annaka Rabbi. In addition to that, now I confess that you are my master. Wa anna ilayka maraddi. And indeed my return shall be to you. This is the summary of all things religion, all things Islamic. Everything boils down to this fact. Can I witness, witness, meaning what? Not see. That means an acknowledgement that comes from the soul, from the heart, from the fitra, from that primordial nature that exists when we isolate ourselves from everything else, everything chaotic that's happening with the world. Can I make a statement like that? This is what the dua is, is, is allowing us to do. The dua that is instructed by the imam teaches us to speak in a way, to say things that are appropriate, number one, but perhaps more important than that, for someone like me, it teaches me how to say something. I don't know how to express myself. If it was just me and Allah with my limited ability to articulate what I'm trying to say, I'll say, you know, Allah, I'm sorry, forgive me, and that's it. It'll last, what, 30 seconds. Imam is doing dua for an hour. What's wrong? Does he, do he doesn't know how to say what he wants to say. Of course he does. There's a procedure now that a person has to go through to prepare the heart to actually say the things that's supposed to be said. And for it to say that and at, a, at a time, at a position, that the heart is now actually understanding what is going on. It's not about just reading something. It's about actually confessing to this really. 
So oh Allah, this is the point that I'm trying to make today, that I fasted now, my mind is not clouded, my vision, my understanding is not clouded. I'm able to put all the superficial things that are happening in this world, this chaotic world, this toxic world. This is not what you created creation for. What kind of a Lord are you? What kind of a master? What kind of a creator are you? If this is what you created? This is my purpose? After all, that's, been, that's all I do. Robotic-like, you know, I go, I work, I come, I eat, I spend time with friends, I sleep, I get up in the morning, repeat, rinse. That's it. Everything was about that. I can see the world is, you know, I know there are things that are wrong in the world. I can't help. I can't do anything about it. So, this is the reality right now that we accept as a Muslim community and as, as Muslims. This is this is what the this is what it was all about. Of course not. So the first point is to make sure that this is not lost. And it's the most basic of, uh, of Islamic teachings. You call the shots. I am serving you. First of all, you don't serve anybody, but I'm serving you. I'm your servant. You are my owner. So tell me what to do. What should I be doing? How do I do it? See, now the mind is opened. There's no reason to think anywhere else to find any other plan of action. The simple fact of looking for a plan of action is a mistake. Is a mistake. You don't want to put God on the, you know, on the, on the planning table, on the planning committee. You don't want to say, we're all here, and then here's your seat, God. Your, God, your seat's nicer than everyone else's. But you still have a seat here on this board. We're all figuring out what to do. No, this is improper. It's disrespectful. You are the only one that belongs to sit on this table. You sit on the throne and tell us what needs to be done. Now a person's, their vision is refocused. It's recalibrated. Where am I supposed to be looking? Where am I looking right now? And what is the result of right now? My action, there's a problem here. So that's number one. The second one now is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now that I've understood you're my master, two things need to happen. Number one is I need to be thankful. In the du'a we have, and I won't read it because we don't have enough time, we're, we're almost out of time. Yeah. In the du'a it says that, Ya Allah, if I wanted to employ all of the faculties that I have, all of the things that you, all of these I wanted to use to thank you for your blessing. Okay? And I wanted to use all of them to just thank one of your blessings. I couldn't do that. I can't. Why? Because right when I take the initiative to thank you for that one blessing that you've given me, I have to give a new thanks. Why? For the thanks that you allowed me to give. Never. There will always be uh, you know, an infinite progression or regression. Never can I allow myself to thank you independent of myself. Any thanks that I give, I have to thank you again for guiding me to this thanks. If you don't guide me, I don't know what to do. So this is the idea of learning how to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dua teaches us that. Humility. Humility. Even the most basic things that I think I should be independent as a receiver, which is thinking. The giver shouldn't teach me how to think. I naturally know how to thank a person. A person holds the door for me, I say thank you. But even then, I need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because you taught me how to do that. Where in my nature? The way you created me. Your creation was in a way that I naturally know to thank a person who does good to me. What's the point here? The point here is that a person now is, is completely engulfed in the blessings and the mercy of Allah. We don't know how to say thank you. This is the point of the dua. Not to repeat a, you know, a, a truism. These are platitudes. If we're just going to say, sit to God and say, Allah, you are the best, I'm the worst. You are the highest, I'm the lowest. We don't need to say these things. These are truisms. Why are we saying them? Because with a clear mind, with an open mind, now we all, we begin to realize, is, is he really the best and am I really the worst? Sometimes I think I'm the best. And finally, we begin to actually express the shortcomings with our tongues. It's important that sometimes we verbalize the shortcomings that we have. And I'll, again, I'll read from some of these. Ya man qalla lahu shukri falam yahrimni. O he whom my gratitude was little, but at the same time you did not deprive me. وَعَذُمَتْ خَتِيَتِي فَلَمْ يَحْذَحْنِي My transgression was great, but you did not disgrace me. I was worthy of being disgraced, you didn't disgrace me. وَرَآنِي عَلَى الْمَعَاصِي فَلَمْ يَشْهُرْنِي You witnessed, you saw me performing sins, acts of disobedience, but you didn't expose me. What are we saying? 
Ya man hafidhani fi sighari O you who protected me in my childhood Ya man razaghani fi kibari O you who sustained me and provided for me in my adulthood Ya man ayadihi indi la tuhsa O he who favors toward me Those favors cannot be reckoned They not, cannot be counted Wa ni'amuhu la tujazi And his blessings cannot be repaid Ya man aradhani bil khayri wal ihsan O he who presented me Who gave towards me Goodness Righteousness, fairness. But I repaid you with evil, with disobedience, with disrespect. This is what's being verbalized in a dua like this. It's not all about you are the best, you are the highest, you are, no. You are the all knowing, you are the all powerful. No. This is a reality. You do good to me, I respond not in kind. I don't even know the most basic and the most simplest. Of natural action which is to give thanks and to respond in kind even that I don't have this is a state of crisis now that on this day when a person is doing this to all they have to feel like they're in a, in, a, in a place of crisis not complacency not like everything is okay because everything is not okay the Imam is teaching us this everything is not okay one day a year two days a year we have to have a fair assessment this is not okay this is not normal, this is not traditional, this is not divine, this is artificial, this is toxic. This way of life is toxic. I have to purify myself. And hence that's what the dua does. It allows for us to, to have these reflections. And to just to summarize, there are a few points which kind of moves us into the next point about Muslim ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. To, summary, to summarize, there's a portion of the dua where now very clearly, explicitly, we begin to say, I am like this, you are like that. I was the one who promised. And I am the one who failed to fulfill my promise. It was I who breached my promise. And it is I right now who am confessing to that. And I testify upon your favors to me and upon me. So this is the summarize. The dua wants us to arrive at this point. I was disloyal to you. I was disloyal to the promise that I made. So what we'd like to do in the few minutes that we have remaining is to understand what it means to be loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we can learn that loyalty in the lives of people who were truly loyal like the companions of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam and tonight specifically Muslim Ibn Abi alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the first thing is that what does it mean to be loyal? And in the context of us, how do we be loyal to the Imam of our time? May Allah hasten his reappearance. Muslim ibn Aqil is a companion of the Imam of his time. So as a, as a Muslim, Atiullah wa Atiul Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Okay, so he is the Imam, I have to be obedient to him. Now we also want to be obedient to our Imam, wherever he is, whatever he's doing. But in any case, this is something that we accept as a part, the tenet of our faith. That there's an Imam, he's in charge, he has been put as, as the vice gerent on this earth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is our connection. So he is supposed to be helping navigate us in our lives and in this world. Okay. Now that we have that as a tenet of faith, what does it mean to be loyal to, to an Imam? The first thing to, to remember is that when a person wants to be loyal to an Imam, the hierarchy should not be forgotten. If we're going to put a hierarchy, Imam, right? Prophet Imam can say Imam. Then where is Allah? He's all the way up there if you even want to call it that. So there's a hierarchy now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course stands at the top. It is impossible for a person to be loyal to their imam without being loyal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Impossible. That's not loyalty. So, Holy Quran teaches us. Make sure that you're loyal to the, uh, to the oath and the pledge that you made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll just share a few of these verses. One is in Surah an nahr Verse 91, وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ إِذَا عَهَدْتُمْ And be, and fulfill the covenant that you made with Allah SWT when you pledge. In Surah Ra'af, for example, أَلَّذِينَ يُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَنْقُضُونَ الْمِيثَاقِ The ulul albab, the people of the intellect, are those people who fulfill Allah SWT's covenant and they do not break their pledge that they made with Allah, the mithaq. The mithaq, they don't break that. In another verse, Surah Al-An'am, in the middle of the verses, towards the end of it, وَبِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْفُوا and make sure you fulfill the pledge that you made with Allah SWT. So what is this pledge that we made? 
And how does this translate to being loyal to the Imam of our time? The point we're making here is this. There are certain basic practices, beliefs, ideas, actions that we as Muslims, Muslim meaning what? Muslim being a person who is submissive to the will of Allah. Don't go anything past just the word itself. Submissive to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Interestingly, Muslim Ibn Aqil was also like that. He's the son of Aqil. Aqil among the four sons of Abu Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay? Aqil, the year that Islam was introduced and he became Muslim, he has a son now. This son is Muslim. He names his son Muslim. Why? Because now he's embraced Islam. He names his son specifically that term, that word, that best signifies and exemplifies the reality of what has happened right now, the change that is happening in his life, and for him to fulfill that role of being a Muslim, being a servant, subservient to the will of God. So when we become Muslim, whether we're born into it or whether we accept Islam, it doesn't matter. The covenant that we make is the same. The shahadatain, at the very least in the first one, that's what we're saying. No person can be Muslim without the shahadatain. Whether it's said verbally or it's inherited. So when you say the shahadatain, what does that mean? They're not words that you're just saying like we said. They're not just words, they have, they have meaning. What is the essence of the shahadatain? What is being expressed here? First of all, that you are, my, you are my Lord, you are my master, and I'm subservient to you, I'm submissive to you. So no, no person can be loyal to their Imam without being loyal to Allah It doesn't exist. What does it mean to be loyal to, to be a good Muslim? Listen, if there's no two ways around it. A person cannot be loyal, a servant, a soldier of the Imam, and not do the most basic with Islamic responsibility. It, it's impossible. I'm telling myself, because I have problems with this, and I'll tell you from my own personal experiences, I can feel a difference. I'm not saying that we are, you are not, we are not the worst people in the world. I can tell you I feel a difference when I'm spending time in the Hawza versus when I'm spending time in America. I can feel a difference. I'm drained. This society, it enervates me. It saps all the energy that exists. I am not the same person, and it scares me. And it puts into perspective, really, the challenges that we are all going through as a community, as younger people, or whatever. It's a reality, we understand that. But at the same time, there's no way for a person to think in their mind that I'm, I am, not I will be, I am, for example, in line with being loyal to my Imam, but I can't even get my prayers in order. I'm telling myself because I have problems. I can't get my prayers in order. I can't be respectful to my parents. I can't keep a promise when I make it with my brother or with my sister. These are, I, I, I don't even care to, to, to worry about, you know, zakat, whatever, it's fine. There's no skipping steps. A person has to naturally, organically grow. This is what it means to be loyal to the covenant that's been made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, with all due respect, a person like me should not call myself Muslim. What should I call myself? A lover of being a Muslim. Why? Because I'm not subservient, I'm not submissive. I have a problem with that. So make sure that this conflict is resolved. So if anything, this conflict resolution happens on a day like this. We grind, we grind, we grind this soul so much until the weaker soul, the lower soul, the desires, the nafs, amara, it finally gives us, okay, you win. Yes, I'm not in charge. This is what the du'a is supposed to do. Perhaps one of the reasons why the du'a is a little long is for this reason as well. If the du'a was five minutes long, everyone would read it really quickly. Because you don't have a lot of opportunity, you may not even think about what you're doing. But if it's an hour long, at some point you're going to have to be thinking about what you're reading. Hopefully, right? And even if those one or two phrases, if you, if you think about what I'm reading, wow, what am I saying here? This is really bad. And then it gets good as well, because the person is now, they're refreshing, they're rebooting. And then they're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. So, Muslim Ibn Aqil as being the representative of the Holy Imam, he sends him to Kufa, because the Kufans are making requests now. Come here, we don't, we don't have a leader, come to us. If you come here, we'll support you. Again, the theme is very similar to the state we find ourselves right now. Although many of us may not be actually writing letters, but the, the, the message is the same. So we're asking Imam to come. Now, Imam says, okay, I'm going to send Muslim Ibn Aqil. And in this letter that he sends, he says, and I'll read this part, I sent you my cousin, because they're cousins, Aqil and 
Amir al-Mu'min. I sent you my cousin, my brother, and a trustworthy person from among my family, Muslim Ibn Aqib. And I've instructed him to inquire about your affairs and write to me regarding it. If he writes to me that your elders, your wise ones, your learned men, all of you hold the same opinion that you've written for me, that means you actually walk the walk. Okay, if you say to that, then I shall come to you quickly, inshallah. So this is the condition now. The Imam is sending Muslim Ibn Aqib to do that. But he uses this idea of right now. He is my brother, he's a trustworthy person. These two have to be together. They cannot be separated. A brother has to be trustworthy. A sister has to be trustworthy. This trust has to be there. So when he says my brother, what is he talking about in the brotherhood? Because they're not literal brothers, they're not blood brothers, they're cousins. So when he says brotherhood, it means it revolves around a friendship, a relationship, a connection, a bond that revolves around a central concept. Any person who has a brother or a sister, or a friend, if you want to call it, that's probably a better word, a friend, it has to revolve around a central concept. Who do you befriend and for what reason? What is the, what is the essence that defines the relationship that you have? Are you friends because the person, for example, is your classmate? So your class defines, your educational experience defines your relationship. Once the class is over, it's very possible that you will cease to be friends with the person, if you want to call them that. Or is the person my friend because we entertain each other, or we, we are friends for the sake of entertainment. So any, any time there's an opportunity to be entertained, that person becomes my friend now. Or is that individual my friend for business, or for travel, or for money, or whatever. There's something that essentially defines the root of what it means to be a brother, what it means to be a friend. So what the Imam here is doing right now is saying that Muslim Ibn Aqil is my brother. Meaning what? We have a bond together that is a real bond and I trust him because of that. The bond that the Holy Quran speaks that only Mu'mineen can have this bond between each other. Every other friendship, every other brotherhood that exists or sisterhood that exists that is based on anything other than Iman or Taqwa, the Holy Quran says that one day it's going to stop working. Your brother, your sisterhood, one day you're going to have a separation. In the Holy Quran, Allah SWT states in Surah Zukhruf, Al-Akhillah yawma idhin ba'dahum li ba'dhin adu. Akhillah, friends. Friends on this day, on this day of judgment, some of them shall become enemies of one another. Illa al-Muttaqin. With exception to one party, and that's the Muttaqin. The Mu'mins who practice and employ this activity and this, uh, this uh, tradition of taqwa. They're protective over their Islamic identity. Only these people will remain friends because only that essence of friendship can actually remain the pressures that the Day of Judgment will bring. It means what the, the, that brotherhood will stand the test of time and the test of not only the, the, uh, the Judgment Day but also the, the, the trials and the, the struggles of this life as well. Hence, in al Mu'minuna Ikhwa, the Mu'min, the true Mu'min, they're brothers with one another, they're sisters with one another. And they have all of those things that has been defined within brotherhood and sisterhood, they have those as well. So I think we have a couple of minutes. I'm just going to summarize real quickly a few things that are a few easy takeaways from this idea of who we can categorize as being our friends. One thing that is found in hadith is that if you want to befriend a person, before you befriend them, make sure just because they're a nice person, it doesn't mean you should just jump in head first into the deep end. No, that's fine. We're not saying pass judgments on anybody. But to be smart, al mu'min is to be smart is to learn how to put a person through a series of tests. You're not trying to humiliate anybody, but you're putting them through a, some sort of a test to make sure do they, are they able to come out still as that brother or sister the same way that you saw them or no? Are they completely another person? So in hadith, there's, there are a few things that are said, and I'll, I'll just read, I guess, one or two of them. This is from Imam Sadiq, if I'm not mistaken. لا تسم الرجل صديقا سمة معرفة Don't call a person your brother or your friend حتى تختبره بثلاث Unless you test them or until you test them with three things. Number one. تُغْذِبَهُ Anger him, upset him. فَتَنْدُرَ غَذَبُهُ يُخْرِجُهُ مِنَ الْحَاقِ الْبَاطِلِ Upset him purposefully. Again, don't make sure you don't do anything that the person harms you or other people. But you're testing them now. Be smart. Make them upset. Because generally when people get upset, they lose their mind. You want to make sure. When this person gets upset, and every person gets upset, Every person has a tipping point. But when that happens, what's going to happen? Is the Hulk going to come out? That's a dangerous person. If the person gets angry and doesn't know right from wrong anymore, just you know, bulldozing everything in their path, that's dangerous. It wants to stay away from this person. After all, you think this person is reformed, this, you know, they've changed? Okay, be smart about it, you test them again, make them angry again. First time, they're probably not going to become angry. Second or third time, they're probably going to lose their patience, they're going to become angry. Then, 
see what happens. Again, please, don't misunderstand me. Don't go around bothering people or angering people just to see, is this person worthy of my friendship or not? No. With pure intentions, please. The second, dinar wa dirham, money, monetary issues. Not like, hey, do you have a dollar? I want to buy a, some water, not, not soda or pop. That's not good. But I, I want a dollar, not, not a dollar. For example, I'm having difficulty in my family. Is it possible? And you know the person has, can I borrow $500? $500 is not a dollar. A thousand dollars is not a dollar. In this economy, you may not even need it. So don't lie. You may need it, or another person may need it. Can you spare me a thousand dollars for a week? I promise to pay you back in a week. If he values your brotherhood, your sister, remember, you're supposed to be friends now. Friends meaning when? In times of need. If you can't, if he's, uh, you know, well, you know, you know, I don't get paid Friday, and then when Friday comes, you know, I have to, you know, what happened, all that. Then you know this person is playing games. And finally, hatta to safir ma'ahu. The third one is very interesting. Until you travel with them. Again, travel brings out the best or the worst or whatever you want to call them, people. Even in traveling like the Hajj, if any of you have gone, you'll find people, interestingly, the character comes out in the Hajj. They're trying to do, you know, tawaf. Around the, and then this person is complaining about, you know, breakfast. You know, breakfast, really, it wasn't, it wasn't what I paid for. You know, I paid for a five-course meal. There was only four courses. Because when I got there, you know, a little kid came and had the last one and I couldn't eat it. Now I'm upset. Okay? You're traveling with this person, you can see the character of this individual. Stay away from them. So those are three things to test an individual. Some hadith that says, anger a person three times. Don't go overboard. The one time I think for most cases is enough. Make you upset them, anger them, see what they do. That's well. uh, there's a hadith here, we don't have time for this. I'll just kind of reference you if you want. In Nahj al towards the end, in the maxims, the sayings that the Imam has. Uh, he has a, it's a pretty lengthy saying, comparatively, and he goes over what he considers to be the model friend. And it begins like this, I used to have a friend that was like this. Go over that and see the Imam, I think he brings something like 12 or 13 different qualities and characteristics that he defines for this model and perfect friend that he had. That he had these sort of characteristics. Read that, I think it's very good to, to shed light on how we should be as far as brothers as well. So the idea is to test. The test needs to be there to make sure this person, these people are actually truly brothers and sisters. So Muslim Ibn Aqil comes to Kufa to test the people. When he comes to test the people, he sees, you know, Muslim Aqil is not there for one or two days. He's there for around 64, 65 days in Kufa. And after 37 days, he writes his letter to the Imam. says, these people seem to be truthful. Because the Imam says, go and make sure that they're not lying. When Muslim Ibn Aqil comes and he reads the letter of the Imam that he wrote to them in response that I've sent Muslim Ibn Aqil to make sure that you guys are telling the truth, many of the Kufans began to cry having heard the letter of the Imam. Of course we're ready. We're, we're waiting for you. You know, we're, we're anxious. We're counting the days until you come. 18,000 people in some records wrote letters. Individual personalized letters. 18, so this is un, unheard of, unseen. What happens now? After he writes the letter, now the pressure comes. Now when the pressure comes, the fitna comes, as the Quran says. Once the fitna comes, then it shows the true colors of a person. Was this person truly a brother of yours? Or were they really just saying something right now because everything was calm? In the Holy Quran, Allah says, Did you think that we were just going to leave you? You said, I have Iman. I'm a Muslim. Or you make calls for the Imam to come, you think we're just going to let you do these things and not test you? Well, fitna. fitna. Fitna means what? Fitna literally doesn't have a negative connotation. Fitna is the process that gold goes through when you want to purify it. You have to heat it to extreme temperatures. And when you heat it to extreme temperatures, the impurities now are separated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm going to put you as a person who makes a statement like, I'm a mu'min, I'm a Muslim, and calling for the Imam to come. Labbayk ya Hussain, labbayk ya Mahdi. Allahumma ajil wa likif. All of these things, we're saying all of these things, right? Allah said, you think I'm not going to test you? I'm going to raise the temperature now and see how you react. The Kufans were not bad people. They, they really wanted the Imam to come. But they were disloyal. Why? Because when the temperature was turned up, all of them began to, one after another, find ways to escape. Very few people, very few people were able to stay loyal. And Muslim Aqil is one of those people who stayed loyal. He could, have, he could have said, hey, listen, everything changed now. He goes praise and sees no one's behind him. He can say, like, you know, the tables have turned. It's time for me to get out of here. He says, no, I'm loyal to the message and the covenant and the promise that I made. 
But not everyone could say that. And perhaps many of us, someone like me, makes bold statements like this, they say bigger than my mouth. When the test comes, I don't know how to react. I shut the door on every opportunity, just like Muslim Aqil. On the night that he's looking for refuge in a city with 18,000 people inviting him, everyone closed the door on him, with the exception of one woman. Let him in, and later the sun comes and exposes what's happening. One woman that doesn't even know what's going on, oblivious. Where were those 18,000 people? You think right now we call for the Imam to come? How many of us are willing to open the door when the temperature is turned up? Temperature turns up means what? You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your scholarship. You're going to get kicked out of school. You're going to be persecuted. You may go to jail. You may be deported. This is what it means for the time. Do you think everything, you know, everything is just going to be perfect, flowery, you know, hunky-dory, then the Imam is just waiting? No. This is what it's going to mean. It's going to mean for the fitna to happen. People have to be tested to see who is telling the truth and who is just lip service, just saying things. So in the legacy of Muslim Ibn Aqil, we saw this as well. The loyalty, people were disloyal. Why? Not because they were essentially bad. Please, don't misjudge me. I'm not saying that anyone here, God forbid, is a bad person. I'm hopefully not saying that I am essentially a bad person. I hope not. But what I am trying to articulate is that it's a lot more difficult than a person just saying that they're ready and even taking initiatives and steps like the Kufans did as well. That doesn't matter. If the end product, if finally, when all is said and done, you failed, then the whole thing is a failure. It doesn't matter if you took nine of ten steps or one of ten steps or no steps at all. Final point that we take away from the life of Muslim Ibn Aqeen, and I'll end with this, his loyalty, I think, when it comes to being a trustworthy individual, the Imam says, I sent you a trustworthy individual. When Muslim Ibn Aqeen, right now his death is imminent, he asks for an opportunity to, to give his final will. In Ibn Ziyad's palace, just give me an opportunity, I want to give my final will. So who is there? He gives to Umar ibn Sa'd. Not by any means a good person, but they have family in the sense that they're both Quraysh. First he says, no, I'm not going to take it. And Ziyad says, take it. You know, he's your, he's, your, he's your brother, he's your family, he's your cousin. Take it from him. Okay. Well, so yeah, I that three things he says as his will. What's the first one? Interesting. He says, I have a debt that needs to be paid. I have 700 dirham that needs to be repaid. I took a, I took a loan from this individual. Make sure he needs to be repaid. For example, I have money in Medina. Go get it from there. Muslim Aqeel, when he came, people were, the Shia were actually there from left and right. The true ones were bringing the Baytul Mal. They were bringing the Wujuhat. The Khum says, I got all of them. They would bring bags of money. He has all the money available to him. Why didn't he just take from the Baytul Mal? No, this doesn't belong to him. At this point, he could have said, these people, they're liars. 18,000 people, all of them, liars. Why do I need to repay them? They don't owe me anything. If anyone, I am a person who is should be receiving. They should be in debt to me, so I should take the 700 from No. It's none of my business to take from something that doesn't belong to me. It's a Beit al It belongs to Allah. It belongs to His Prophet. It belongs to the Imam, not me. Again, these are small teaching points that even sometimes we find ourselves, when we come to the service of Islam, the service of the Imam, we find ourselves, you know, our, our feet begin to shake here. Yeah, you know, this, this, this money is for that, for example, I'm so, but, you know, if I buy myself a, a bottle of water, it's not really not a big deal. You know, there's $10,000 I was donated. With that 10000 I worked hard here. Come on, I set up the chairs, I took the chairs down. I rec- if I buy myself a bottle of water, who's going to care? The imam's going to care, he's not going to care. Of course, he'll be happy because I help. No, it's not for you and I to say that. Go borrow a dollar from your brother and then buy the water with that. This is the loyalty, this is the trust that people like Muslim Ibn they teach us these things. And they act as points of reflections for us to look inwardly and say, if we want to be loyal to the cause of the Imam, loyal to the cause of being Muslim, truly, what does that mean? And how far am I from that reality? What can I do to better myself? This day is the day to, to have this sort of realization. And begin to plan from tomorrow, Eid, the return, the return, a blank slate. Tomorrow is the first day of the rest of your life, or it's supposed to be at least within the Muslim community. Not like every other day that we just come and we pray together and we see family. Those are all good things. But if it's not the first day of the rest of your life, then that day is not an Eid. It's not a return. It's not a new start. It's not a fresh start. It's just another day. So the very essence of that day is lost. Like we said, essence. Everything else is there. If the essence is lost, the whole thing, you know, 
the perspective really gives uh, value of what's happening. So on a day like this, on a night like this, that we're, we're, we're approaching the eve of the Eid, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of this day that we make mistakes. You know, they say to human is to err. We're not perfect, we know that. But at least we can say this much, we're trying. That means we want to be better people. We know that we're not perfect, but we want to better ourselves. So that's the first thing we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgive our shortcomings. Because we know there are plenty of shortcomings. Forgive us for that on the final moments that we have of this day. Second is we want to be loyal to the cause. Teach us how to be loyal and allow us the, the, the energy and the inspiration that is needed for us to take those bold steps that allow us to institute some sort of change in our lives. That's what's most important. And inshallah tomorrow to be a blessed day for us, our families, and for the greater Muslim community inshallah. That if we are able to institute change in ourselves, perhaps we can change and we can stop some of the Karbalas that are happening in the Muslim world right now. They're happening, whether we know it or not. Like many people, they didn't know Karbala was happening. After the fact, they figured out that yes, this happened. So for many of us, let's make sure that we prevent from being in a position like that. After the fact, we figured out that all of these injustices were being committed and we were oblivious to them, inshallah. Um, please forgive me for not only going over time, but if, if I didn't present something that was to your liking, if something was inaccurate, please forgive me for my shortcomings and it's time for Adhan as well. I know we were trying to fit in a question and answer. Again, my, my apologies for that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.